Hello fans of history and welcome to History Rocks. Today we're going to take a look at the end of World War I and the Treaty of Versailles. And ultimately the question is, were the Germans treated fairly by the Treaty of Versailles? And did the Treaty of Versailles lay the foundation for future conflict? Did it truly end the war or did it just bring about a 20 year truce? Well, first to understand that we need to take a look at the end of the war itself. Germany had been uh, facing a lot of difficulties primarily due to the naval blockade that the British had put into place. They're fighting a two front war and they have the, uh, the naval blockade in the North Sea which makes it impossible for the Germans to be able to provide enough food for their own people. I mean, even during peacetime, the Germans are in need of foreign imports of wheat to be able to provide enough food for their people. However, once the war begins, the Germans are in dire straits because uh, twice they're going to have what they call their turn-up winter, first in 1916 and 17, and then into 1917 and 18. During those winters, the only thing they can really provide for their people through rationing are turnips. And turnips, while plentiful, are not very good, nor are they very filling. And so the people uh, of Germany are left with the situation where they're dependent upon the government to give them rations. And the rations that the government were able to provide would be only 900 calories per person per day. So the government tried to uh, add to that a little bit by creating what was called ersatz food. Ersatz means fake or chemically produced food and this ersatz food would be where if we don't have enough wheat and flour to make bread for the people what we'll do is we'll take a little bit of flour and then add a whole bunch of sawdust because you know sawdust will keep them full even if it doesn't make them very well fed so women who were standing in the queues for their rations for their family would carry with them their butcher knives just in case there was a stray dog or a horse that was left unattended on the streets of Berlin. This lovely picture that you see here is an indication of the what the women did within only a short amount of time as they're standing there and they see a horse standing left unattended. They go and they slit the throat of the horse and then they take as much as they can. This picture just taking taken an hour after some women attacked this horse. Not much of it left now. The government was so afraid in Germany in 1918 of its own women that the secret police were reporting that if something is not done soon, that there could be a revolt led by women that will overthrow the Kaiserreich of Germany. So Germany's certainly struggling at this point. Their allies are falling as well. By the summer of 1918, both Austria-Hungary and the Ottoman Turk Empire had uh, either fallen completely and their government overthrown by its people, or there wasn't much left to speak of. And at that point, the German offensive had failed. So the spring offensive of 1918, uh, that the Germans had uh, been able to push the Western Front a full 28 miles, which was the largest advance in all of World War I since 1914, they thought that they could do it. They thought they could take out Paris, but it just wasn't quite enough. Not quite enough to be able to actually win the war, plus 100,000 Americans were showing up each week. 100,000 doughboys showing up each week to the front lines. And they engaged in what was called, with the rest of the Allies, the Hundred Days Campaign to try and push the Germans back as far as possible. This yellow line represents the line of furthest German advance in World War I by 1918, and the green line indicates the Hindenburg Line, which is the final line of defense. It was also known as the Siegfried Line, by the way. And so this line of defense is the final uh, push that the uh, the Hundred Days campaign was able to do against the Germans. And it's important to consider the fact that this final defensive line is still in Belgium, still in France, and only a small portion of it toward the bottom is actually in Germany. So what the Germans will continue to believe is that they're doing pretty well. They're still in enemy territory. They think that they're winning. And so that's important to consider when we look at what happens next. Because by November, of 1918, the Germans are convinced that it's a losing war effort, but they need to do something to come out with a win. They're going to, going to seek the win through a naval attack on the Allied lines, even dabbling in the idea of a potential invasion of England while their backs are uh, turned, uh, while they're busy on the Western Front, which is just stupid, and the Navy knew it. The sailors decided that they would mutiny instead of follow those orders into what they knew would be a suicide mission right as the war is ending. So that is going to send the government into disarray. The government then appeals to the Allies 
allies for peace terms. However, the allies tell Germany that they refuse to work with a Kaiserreich. They will not work with Kaiser Wilhelm II, and uh, they will only work with a democracy, a new government in Germany. So the Germans debate over it for a couple of days, and then they force the Kaiser Wilhelm II to abdicate his throne. He will then go into exile and live out the rest of his days in retirement. Well, on November the 9th, the Germans are asking the Allies for peace. The Allies are telling them, yes, we will discuss peace when the ceasefire goes into effect. We'll call an international peace treaty and discuss it. But the Germans, by 1918 in November, are convinced maybe they hadn't lost. They're hoping that they're going to get the peace without victory that Woodrow Wilson had been proclaiming should be done since 1914. So uh, now that the new government is being formed, it's called the Weimar Republic. It will not go into effect until January of the next year, but they are in the process of this when the uh, decision is made to sign an armistice. Now an armistice means a ceasefire. Now at this point, the people are told that an armistice is going to go into effect. That armistice will go into effect on November the 11th at 11 a.m. So that means that at on the 11th day of the 11th month in 1918 at 11 a.m., 11, 11, 11, 1918 is when this will go into effect, that the armistice will be signed and that they will stop shooting their guns. Now, the people of America and all over Europe are excited. For the first time in four years, they're going to start to ring the bells of the churches around Europe, proclaiming an end to this war. However, at the same time, uh, what many people don't talk about is in those last six hours of battle, even though they knew the armistice would be signed, in those last six hours of battle, the Allies are going to do one major push, one more final push. Everyone's expecting that the fighting is over at this point, but in the last six hours before the armistice goes into effect, the Allies will send uh, their hundreds of thousands of men into battle against the Germans, hoping for that last bit to drive the Germans back, potentially even break their lines so that it looks like they had won. The Americans themselves will lose over 3,200 casualties in just six hours. The rest of the Allies will sustain another 10,000 casualties in just six hours. And it's, I mean, unfathomable to think of this senseless waste of life, unless you consider the fact that Germany was still in enemy territory. And so this is important to consider as we look at the end of the war and the armistice. The Germans are convinced that they are technically undefeated, that while they are in a losing war, and there's no way that they could fight it to a, a conclusion that would win, they're convinced that since they're in enemy territory, many of them believe that this is still a peace without victory, in which everyone goes their separate ways, realizes that was a mistake, and, you know, hopefully we never do it again. Well, the Allies will not be convinced of that, of course, uh, but the Germans after they find out about the Treaty of Versailles and the way that it will destroy Germany over the next several years, many of the men in the trenches who'd fought for Germany thought that this new government, this Weimar Republic of Social Democrats, which they claimed were a bunch of socialists and Jews, are the ones who stabbed them in the back. Even though they had won, they had stabbed them in the back. And one of those veterans of the German army was Adolf Hitler, who was, uh, after being a trench runner in World War I, was recovering from a gas attack in a soldier's hospital when he found out that the armistice had been signed. And he will soon become incredibly angry or furious if you will, over what's going to happen next with the Treaty of Versailles. The big question when we get into 1919, now that the shooting is done in 1918, the members of these combatant nations will meet at Versailles in 1919. And the big question is, who's to blame? Who should have to pay? And how do we stop this from happening again? Well, uh, something like 83 countries were involved in the Treaty of Versailles, and they're going to meet to discuss who's to blame, and there's a lot of uh, fingers obviously pointed at Germany. And since Germany obviously was the one that killed the Archduke, right? Wrong. That was some Serbian terrorists that did that. The Black Hand and Gavrilo Princip were the ones that killed the Archduke. So if it wasn't Germany that killed him, uh, are they really to blame? Well, then again, there's also the issue of who mobilized their troops first. It was the Russians. The Russians mobilized their troops first in 1914, and mobilization at this time is an act of war. So therefore, is it the Russians' fault as well? 
problem is that the Russians no longer exist. They're starting to call themselves the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. They're having a civil war right now to see who should gain control of the government. They no longer exist and no one recognizes them as an actual power. So you can't blame the Russians at the moment because that wouldn't work. You could maybe blame the Germans, of course, for their blank check that they wrote to the Austro-Hungarians. Maybe also blame the Austro-Hungarians while you're at it. However, their government now ceases to exist as well. So that leaves us with, well, Germany's to blame for that whole blank check. Uh, they declared war, as, uh, but so did so much of the rest of Europe. I mean, think of Great Britain, for instance. Did Great Britain really need to defend Belgium? I mean, yeah, that makes sense. But did France need to pull their troops back a full 11, uh, 11 kilometers in order to allow the Germans to take that section of France and therefore make them look like a victim? France intentionally lost the first part of the war to look like a victim. Was that necessary? Are they maybe to blame here as well? Did America have to trade illegally in the form of $2.3 billion in trade loans to the Allies while claiming to be a neutral power? Is that truly neutral? Are they maybe to blame here as well? The fact is that all of these powers are to blame. But the one country that will receive all of the blame for this entire war is Germany. And is that justified? Well, one primary reason for all of this, of course, is because the war was so incredibly cataclysmic. It was so terrible and catastrophic for all of Europe that every single country that was involved in it felt that they had reason to deserve some gains. They felt that they had gained something from this war. And every country after the war is not looking to promote peace and prosperity for all these countries involved. Instead, at Versailles, they're looking for what can I get out of this? What land, what advantage, who can be brought down a peg so that our country is brought up several pegs? Wilson's trying to mediate through all of this, but there's so much nationalism that is so powerful at this time in the post-war years that it's going to be impossible to bring about any kind of equitable peace. So when these combatant nations met in 1919 at uh, the Treaty of Versailles. They're going to head to the Palace of Versailles, of course, former Louis XIV Palace. They're going to meet in places like the Hall of Mirrors to discuss what should the terms of this treaty be. Well, the entirety of the Treaty of Versailles is going to deal specifically with Germany. Other treaties will be done for Austria, for what's left of Austro-Hungary and what's left of the Turks, etc. But the Treaty of Versailles is specifically Germany. Now, the big four are going to be the ones that are leading this Treaty of Versailles. Now this is important to analyze because of the fact that every single international peace treaty, every time we've had a major peace treaty that's been called to end a war all the way since 1648, for the last 300 years at this point, every time we call a treaty, all of the combatant nations are involved, including the losers, and the losers get to have their say on how the treaty should end. But these are the big four that are going to run the treaty here at Versailles. One of them, of course, is Woodrow Wilson. Woodrow Wilson for the United States is going to end up making a bad name for himself amongst his Republican adversaries in Congress because of the fact that he's going to be the first president in American history to spend a significant time abroad. So while president, he's going to leave and spend six full months in Europe ignoring what's happening in Washington, which is going to come back to bite him, by the way, when we try to end this uh, peace treaty and get it ratified by Congress. They're also critiquing the fact that he is doing this by himself without any help from Republicans, and the fact that he's playing his own ambassador, which is not what a president should be doing. But the reason he's doing it is because he's got higher ideals that he's hoping to promote. Then from England, we have David Lloyd George, who was re-elected in 19 under the campaign 1918 under the campaign slogan of make Germany pay. Then over there on the right with the beautiful flowing mustache is Clemenceau of France. They called him the Tiger because he wanted revanche for France and take that at the expense of the Germans. Then we've got Vittorino Orlando of Italy, who's just tickled pink to be invited because Italy has not been treated as a major power throughout their history, and so now, now it's their chance. So that's exciting, right? Now who's missing? The Germans. The Germans are missing. They were not invited. And was that intentional? Yes, the Germans were not invited because they wanted this treaty to specifically deal with Germany and find a way to punish it. Now, when Wilson arrived in January of 1919, he had his 14 points, which are a system of 
very idealistic kinds of ideas to try and find a way to promote peace and end future wars. And I gotta say, I love the guy for trying, but unfortunately, none of it's going to work. All right, so I'll just summarize those 14 points for you. First, he says that there can be no more secret treaties because after all, secret treaties are what brought this war about in the first place. And also, we need to guarantee freedom of the seas because the sinking of passenger liners and merchant ships was what brought the United States into this war as well. Also, he wants to promote democratic self-determination. There's far too many countries out there uh, in Europe that have been like Germany for too long, where they are Kaiserreichs or they are autocracies or dictatorships. He wants to see democratic self-determination be the thing that is the new system of the world even though it's got a lot of growing pains and it comes with its hazards as well. Another thing that he wants to do is see a reduction of armaments in which no country has a standing army anymore. No more need for war in the future. Now, uh, another thing he hopes to see is a redrawing of boundaries to make sure that every country is done based upon its ethnic divisions and therefore has more stability, he hopes. And finally, he wants to have a League of Nations in which the people of each nation will meet to promote moral influence instead of having um, the necessary use of military force. In the past, anytime we've had a problem with a dictator or a funny mustachioed, Zeke Heiling type of person out there, you know what we should do is we should just take them out with the military. Here, he's saying we should surround them with a moral influence to promote peace and prosperity around the globe. It's a beautiful idea, but the problem is none of this is going to work. Let's first take a look at the results of the treaty, uh, specifically for uh, Europe and Germany as well in particular. So for Europe at large, the territory that's going to be redrawn here, the, dissol the dissolution of the Austro-Hungarian Empire and the Ottoman Turks, not going to go so well because there's a lot of ethnic divisions that will be violated and arbitrarily applied, and it will lead to future dictatorships. So each of these countries will be given the gift of democracy initially, but by the time, over the next 20 years, as they're trying to promote this idea of democracy, every single one of these countries is going to fall to either a totalitarian regime or a dictatorial autocratic regime over the next 20 years, except for one. Only one will remain a democracy before World War II, and that is Czechoslovakia, and they will get sold out once Hitler is trying to take over their country. More on that later. Meanwhile, we've got German war guilt, which is going to mean that they are being blamed for the entirety of this war. Some things that go along with that are massive reparations payments in the form of $80 billion. $80 billion is what the Germans will owe. That is half a trillion dollars by today's standards. It's going to be absolutely atrocious for the German people. Another thing that they're going to lose is a lot of territory. They're going to lose uh, a, a chunk of territory called um, the Polish cor Corridor, which is going to go to the new country of Poland to make it sure that they're not landlocked. They're going to lose Alsace and Lorraine to give that over to the French again. Going to lose a little chunk that's going to go over to Belgium as well. And the Saar coal fields will be given over to France as a repayment for the war debt. Meanwhile, the Rhineland must be completely demilitarized and the Germans are no longer allowed any military above 100,000 men as a defensive force. They're not allowed to have a navy or an air force. Now this is going to be a very tough pill to swallow. Consider the effects upon Germany here. With an $80 billion dollar uh, debt that they must repay, that's going to send their government into chaos to the point where their government's going to go bankrupt before it even has a chance to get off the ground. When the government of the Weimar Republic was presented with the terms of this Treaty of Versailles, it was a 283 page document and they were given 30 days to reply. They had to reply on June the 28th, 1919, which was the fifth anniversary of the assassination of the Archduke Franz Ferdinand, and they basically had a gun to their head saying, if you don't sign, it's war again. So at this point, they signed the document, even though they had over 400 pages worth of criticisms against the Treaty of Versailles, nothing can be done about it. They have to sign it. It's going to send their government into an absolute downfall um, that's going to lead to the breakdown of German society as we know it, at least temporarily. So some examples of that, if we take a look at their reparations payments, $80 billion is half a trillion dollars by today's standards. They predicted at the time that it would take until 1984 to pay back the war debt, but it will in fact take the German government all the way until October of 2010 to make their final war debt payments for World War I, nearly 100 years of paying a war debt. So the reparations are going to cause their economy to go into a downfall. Good example of that is the Deutschmark to the US dollar ratio. 
1914, when the war began, the Deutschmark was 4 to 1 to the US dollar. Not great, but not that bad. At the end of the war, in 1919, the German Deutschmark was 9 to 1 to the US dollar. By the time we get into 1922, it was 500 to 1. By the time we get to 1923, in January, it was 18,000 to 1. In July, 350,000 to 1. August, 5 million to 1. And finally, a newspaper cost 100 billion Deutschmarks in November of 1923. At that point, the inflation rate was 3.25 billion percent inflation. And if you want to know how the Germans felt about it, just take a look at this crowd. They're not pleased about the terms whatsoever. Nor are these millions of unemployed soldiers, one of which is going to start to form a political army very soon called the Nazis, and try to overthrow the government in a pusht, or a overthrow of the regime. Another thing that they're doing is printing money like crazy. With 3.25 billion percent inflation, that means that they're printing Deutschmarks, um, just, just getting them hot off the press and into the hands of the people hoping that they'll actually be worth something. However, a Fünf billion in Marken is worth nothing. Five billion dollar mark is worth nothing to the point that it's just garbage in the streets. I mean, uh, it would take an entire wheelbarrow full of five mil billion dollar marks to be able to get a loaf of bread. This meant that many people, especially women, had to resort to prostitution in order to pay just for the bare necessities for their families. And often husbands were even pimping their own wives out to be able to pay for bare necessities. Meanwhile, our kids, you know, they're just taking our life savings and playing with them as toys. And you know what? Why not? Because the Allies have screwed us. So, at this point, not really fair for the Germans. Not really fair at all. But at the same time, they will take the brunt for the entirety of the war. Now the question is, what will it be like across the sea over the United States? How is the United States reacting to all of this? Well, Wilson is trying to get this bill to pass through Congress, but the problem is that the Senate uh, does not like the idea of the League of Nations, fearful that it will deprive Congress of their constitutional right of declarations of war. And so this means that Wilson's going to have a lot of problems convincing people. He's got his option, which is the progressive internationalists, hoping that they can convince the American people that this war needs to be for the right purpose to promote peace throughout the world, and the only way to maintain that is through the League of Nations. Meanwhile, the irreconcilables see this as a failure and that we should have absolutely nothing to do with Europe or its problems. We should be isolationist. Then we have the reservationists who feel that there are some good things about the uh, Treaty of Versailles and the League of Nations, but there's a lot that we don't like, especially how it could bind Congress and disallow us from being able to declare war. One of the leaders of that movement is Henry Cabot Lodge, who's the Republican leader against Wilson in Congress. And the question is, who's right and why? I mean, which policy should the United States take? Well, the American people are torn on it as well, and Wilson's going to do his darndest to try and convince them that it's the right thing to do. Wilson will t take it to the people on an 8,000 mile train trip across the United States, going back and forth across the US, making 40 speeches in 20 over the course of 22 days. And it will take such a strain on him that he'll end up having a stroke that will leave him debilitated and paralyzed on his left side. Now, there was a lot of fear amongst his closest advisors who knew about his stroke that in his last six months of office that this would be viewed as a sign of political weakness and that perhaps Congress would try to impeach this man who's now confined to a wheelchair and seemingly unable to do his job. So his wife, Edith Wilson, is going to work behind the scenes to try and make sure that no one except his closest advisors knows about his stroke and she'll do everything to try and help him continue his work in his last six months. But unfortunately, it just won't be enough. You see, by July of 1921, the war had still not technically ended for the United States. Even though the Treaty of Versailles had been ratified by every other nation um, that was involved, except the United States at this point, even though the war had ended three years earlier, finally the U.S. government is going to declare a joint resolution for peace ending our state of war, but without signing the treaty of Versailles, and that will be incredibly important for the things to come, because the United States enters into an isolationist policy. You can see here the League of Nations bridge that was designed by President Wilson, but now Uncle Sam is staying out, and without us, England will also not be involved, and so France is going to try and 
lead this League of Nations by itself in Europe, and it's not going to go well, because international strife will first hit uh, the streets of Berlin, it'll hit the streets of Rome, we're going to see fascist ultra-nationalists starting to take over governments in Europe. And Italy will be the first to become a fascist state under Benito Mussolini. After Italy became a fascist state, Germany too will start to have some political turmoil uh, going back and forth between fascist and communistic style uh, types of leadership. And then finally, of course, Hitler will take over in 1933 as chancellor, which paves the road for us to World War II. And all of this due to the mistakes made in the Treaty of Versailles and the lack of U.S. involvement in the League of Nations certainly played a role in that too. So so rather than promoting peace and making this to the, the war to end all wars, the French are going to start to plan for the next war, investing $12 billion into the creation of the Maginot Line and then spending $2 billion per year uh, maintaining that Maginot Line. And so if my math serves me correctly, that's roughly $52 billion that they're going to end up spending trying to plan for the next war. And that involves all kinds of concrete pillboxes above the ground with artillery and machine gun emplacements aimed at Germany. And then uh, a bunch of underground tunnels and barracks and radio stations and even underground train stations to keep this thing supplied in preparation for what they see as the next and certainly perhaps an inevitable war. Well, sadly for the French here, uh, it'll take the Germans two days, essentially, to get past the Maginot Line through the use of, of paratroopers and panzer tanks. So, totally not worth it. Now, another thing to consider, too, about this um, is that people, as early as 1919 and 1920, were realizing that this is not a piece that it's that's probably going to last. I mean, people were already predicting that this may end up only being a prolonged ceasefire or a what will become a 20-year truce. Many people are looking at the unlimited indemnity payment that the Germans owe to the rest of the Western world and saying that there's no way that Germany, which is a critical block of the economy, if they can't get back on their feet, then the rest of these nations are going to have a hard time too. And then in 1919, this cartoon came out called Peace and Future Cannon Fodder. And it see, we see Woodrow Wilson, Clemenceau, or Orlando, and David Lloyd George uh, walking out of the peace treaty agreement. And and um, Clemenceau says, Curious, I seem to hear a child weeping. And he looks over and sees a young child crying in the corner called the Class of 1940. So as early as 1919, the people of Europe are already predicting that the seeds of the next war are already infused into every page of the Treaty of Versailles. Thanks for watching.